imagine. And sail planning is right next to it. And that's very, very gratifying. That, uh, and, and of course, now if you're talking performance, now you're talking jet. You're not going to break a speed barrier in one of these things. But uh, when you break the speed barrier, that's really no real big deal either. That it's, uh, but it's, uh, it, it is an accomplishment, let's say it that way. Uh, I can remember a, a thrill that I really got. You know, I was first checking out in jets. I was making a, what they call a round robin, just flying around for get some practice. And uh, it, it, I remember I was at 40,000 feet coming from Phoenix, and I was going up to Los Angeles and back down to San Diego. And I got up to the Los Angeles area, and I'd never been up this high before that I know of. And that uh, I looked down and I saw something that, that looked like Point Loma, and I could see it off. You know, on the horizon, as, as I recall it. And I figured, well, this can't be. But then I checked it. Yeah, it was. I mean, the visibility was nice and clear that day. We had like 100 mile visibility. And from LA, you can see San Diego. You get up above 50,000 feet, and you can start to see the curvature of the Earth. And these are thrilling things. Uh, up in, we're fl flying out of Newfoundland, and I can remember being up above the heavy, fog layers, no, cloud layers. And when you're up, and if you go down right to the tippy top of the layer and fly the jets, the uh, prop wash from the plane, that it, it makes the, the cloud swirl behind you. And it looks, you look to the back, and it's a, a dip, a, like a little ditch that you went through. So all you do is blew the clouds, the heat from the engines, I guess uh, vaporizes the, the moisture in the air for that little bit, and huh. kind of like contrails. But those are. Th but as far as the thrill of flying, the relationship of uh, uh, I'll say man versus the air and all around you, then the smaller the plane, the lighter and the less stuff. I find the most exciting that. That, that you read these books about pilots with nearness to God and nearness to nature. Yeah. Those, those are the times that it comes, not when you're strapped into all this electronic stuff. Right. And, yeah. Metal around yeah. So many of the planes now, the pilot isn't even really flying the plane. He is controlling the electronics that fly the plane because the reactions needed to fly that plane are so demanding and have to be executed so rapidly that the human can't respond to it. The so he it, is yeah. responding, the human is controlling a quote computer that is controlling that, that airplane. Right. Now that, and that's not all of them, but there are some of the fancy ones that are the more mo tricked out. Yeah. yeah, that are, that's what I understand. I haven't flown those planes. Okay, where are we at here? Now we're at, uh, we're, oh, we're finishing up flying these Ferry squadron things. Mm -hmm. you, you want this to go on yet? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. We're, uh, uh, <laughs> so we, the, the ferry squadron deal. That, uh, then I was, uh, at, after that, uh, now again, see we're getting into uh, more use of radar and things in the Navy and CIC, Combat Information uh, Center, the CIC, on, uh, and they're starting to appoint officers to do this job on, on ships and things like that. So uh, I was assigned to CIC school back in Chicago, in, uh, at Great Lakes, as I recall it. I think he's, <laughs> well, that, uh, and uh, I, went, I went to CIC school back there for I forget how long. And I, I personally, this uh, personal note here, but in my lifetime, I know I haven't smoked a carton of cigarettes. I doubt that I have smoked one pack of cigarettes in my lifetime. Okay, but back at CIC school, I'd seen pictures and the CIC officers, if they smoked a pipe, now the duty of the CIC officer, you're in this room with these big screens and stuff around and you are controlling uh, your aircraft to intercept enemy aircraft and things like this. And so you're looking at this and this and you're telling people what to do. And the ones that had, they'd have a, a straight stem pipe, it had to be a straight stem, and in their mouth, and they'd say, like, uh, a take bogey three with cap four. 
And and point to it, yeah. Oh. And that looked so dramatic to me that while I was in CIC school, I learned to smoke a pipe. Oh, you do today still? Or? I use, I, I quit not too many months ago because yeah. I've got these problems with my leg and body, and I'm oh, grasping okay. at every straw that I can to try to improve my general health. Right. And although I still enjoy a little a pipe now and then, that. Uh, I, I, I have completely quit, although I still carry it in the car and I suck on it once in a while, but I haven't put any but tobacco in it now for a while. <laughs> Foolishness, I know. But, but uh, anyway, so I went to that CIC school in Chicago, and that's the only thing I can remember uh, about that really was the pipe, although the, the school itself was interesting too. And then I was assigned a seaplane ten, uh, a ship, a seaplane tender as the CIC officer on that ship, and we uh, operated our home base was Alameda, but we spent, oh, I guess well over half our time in the, in the Pacific, uh, Philippines. Uh, we got over to Hong Kong, Japan, uh, down to uh, the Singapore area, uh, uh, Siam, it's not Siam anymore. But any, anyway, that's where we were. And I, I, so I worked, worked at that job on, on the ship. Uh, that was a, about a year and a half, two year tour, as I recall. And after that, let's see, what did I do after that? Oh, then I was assigned to uh, Navy, uh, the air station at El Centro. And with the uh, unit down there was the Navy parachute unit. Uh, and in, I stayed there about three years. Now, a lot of people, they didn't like El Centro because mainly the weather, hotter than hell and all that sort of stuff. But the job was extremely interesting. I think that it's probably the most interesting job I've had in the Navy uh, in that at that time, we were working with ejection seats. Well, they were not known at that time but they were working on it in England, and we ended up working with Martin Baker in London and different procedures for uh, the escaping of a pilot from a uh, disabled or burning airplane. And <laughs> we were working also with NASA on the space program on recovery capsules and things like this. And uh, just in general, it was, you never really knew what the next project was going to be, and, uh, but it was very, very Exciting, interesting, yeah. very interesting. Uh, we had uh, the planes we had for training were both jets and props and uh, used all of them. Uh, what we would, one of the things that we would do is uh, a, a take a, uh, an airplane, and this, the one that I remember specifically was a T-33, a, a jet, single engine jet with two place, and you'd have a, a, the live pilot in the front, and then in the back seat you'd put a dummy and uh, uh, a, uh, some kind of a parachute escape system. And we're talking now ejection seats where that you'd go along and, uh, and, and fire this seat out and so to, to, if the pilot would have to get out of a a burning plane or something like that, really fast, and yeah. and uh, and it was part of the experimental program. And in fact, the guy, no, not that I relieved, but he was in the squadron right before I got there. That uh, he was flying this plane, it, it, and one of the T-33s down there, just a couple weeks before I got there, and uh, fired fired the ejection seat, and there was a malfunction, and the. Uh, seat did not come out as fast and clear as well as it should and it tipped over and knocked the tail off his plane. He's only about a thousand feet off the ground and he couldn't recover. He was killed. Oh. And uh, that's the kind of thing we were doing. We lost only one other parachute guy while I was down there. But it was on, uh, we had uh, jumpers in the squadron where that it actually tested the parachutes and stuff, the different types, uh, a military parachute and a skydiving parachute are, in a sense, uh, kind of different things. The skydiving parachute is a relatively comfortable device to use in that when it opens, it uh, opens slowly because you're not going to jump deliberately at any low altitude. But military parachutes are, de are designed for rapid opening. And when they open, they, cr they go crack and uh, I, I saw stars on several occasions when I jumped, 
and because the shock is is very great when when that right. thing hits. But the, there's a, there's a logic behind it. That, right. uh, so, but that's what we were doing, and very like I say, very very interesting work. One of the episodes that I recall, we were working with a company out of Minneapolis, Winson Company, as I think the name was, and what they their assignment in the project was to provide a balloon to take a dummy, an anthropomorphic dummy, one that's size, shape, weight of a human, send it up to 70,000 feet, and then have this, quote, dummy escape from the balloon, parachute down to Earth. The preface for space, returning from space, that they, if the guys have to get out of the capsule for some dumb reason as they're descending, that uh, you have to have things for this. It's possible that the pilot would be unconscious. So you have to have things automatic. And this is the kind of things we're doing. Well, anyway, on this one occasion, we went up to a Palm Springs area. Uh, it wasn't Palm Springs, but Palm Desert, a little, little town up there. And we launched this balloon that uh, it was a helium balloon, as I recall, up to, up to 70,000 feet, and had this capsule parachute mechanism in it, and we released it over the area down there, the mountains, Southern California, Arizona area, and had filmed uh, cameras tracking and all, all this stuff coming down. Well, then, theoretically, you go and you pick this dummy up and examine it for blah, blah, blah. And we got, we never found that dummy. It, it landed someplace near the Chocolate Mountains, uh, east of El Centro, uh, we spent about two or three days looking out there for, the, for that dummy and never found it. Now, wow. my theory of what happened to it is that the dummy came down in the mountains uh, there, a uh, little east of El Centro, Glamis area, the dunes, and there's mountains there. And there was a lot of mining and stuff in this area, too. In, in past years, there was mining. So my theory is that this dummy came down and went through a, a crevice between two steep hills and got down into where some rocks are and things like that, and we, we could never find it. And huh. so I'm, what I'm thinking is that someday, if it hasn't already happened, and I don't think so, is that some, some prospective miner is going to be up there looking for whatever he's looking for, mine, he's and he's going to come across this thing. <laughs> now, it's, it, what it would be is to all intents and purposes, it would look like a human being in this flight suit and stuff. And this was for coming back from space. So what I think that if the guy was not of a very clear thinking, in a clear thinking mode, he would think it was somebody from outer space. Right. And this was the period when we had all this aliens coming and landings and things. So everybody was alien happy. And that's what I can figure somebody, and of course I, embellish it a bit. I figure if this guy had been drinking the night before and he would come into this and hear this thing would be stuck here, he would be sure that it had to be somebody from outer space. Wow. But I don't know. We never, to my knowledge, we, the never dummy's been never found. been found. Are you sure someone didn't but, steal it? What's that? Are you sure someone didn't steal it? Well, uh, I suppose it's possible that they would have, but I know we, we had all, tags on it and stuff that, you know, if located, I don't remember if there was a reward involved, but I mean, this was a, well, I don't know how many dollars that whole little episode cost, but I mean, it was one of these expensive research programs. Yeah, and, they were found the dummy. And, and I don't know what anybody would really want with heavy thing. I don't, I don't want, I just don't know. That's one to speculate on. But that was an interesting tour there in Key West. Very, very interesting. Okay, Maybe after that, El let's Central. see. You mean El, El Centro? Yeah, I mean El Centro, yeah. Yeah, you said Key West. I'm sorry? You said Key West. Okay, I, okay. Thank, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That, uh, well, Key West was too. I've that was a, interesting too. Yeah, yeah that, I've, I tell you, I've had lots of interesting ones. Lots Sounds of good, like it, wow. Lots of good ones. So what, about what year are we up to now? Okay, now uh, uh, 1956, 1957, wow. 58. I'm going to leave Key West in 59 or something like that. And uh, this was, we're getting back to the dual line, the dual line in, in the report here. Okay. That, uh, then I was uh, 
again, I, like I say, multi-engine qualified, and uh, they were they were needing people. This was during the Cold War when we were 